French Open. We have, uh, what is that? Can't read it. It says 10 minutes until Andy Murray versus where Rinka is going to play. It's a French building. Then Judith's taking a picture. A bunch of people. A bunch of people. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. Who knows? So there's the cameras. There's the tennis court. Those are the people measuring the tennis court. Tennis. There's a guy taking a picture, waving. Uh, there's a little airplane thing right here. Zip line. The French Open at Roland Garros. On June 9th, 2017, I attended the French Open courtesy of my brother Josh. I felt a little crappy because I knew Josh really wanted to go, and I never even thought about going. In fact, I never even watched a full tennis match on the internet filmed at the French Open. I didn't want to bring a recording device because I thought it was not allowed, but I was mistaken. So to pre preserve my experience, I'll try to recall the event before I forget how amazing it was. Josh got Judith and me an apartment through Airbnb above a rotisserie shish kebab restaurant open until 2 a.m. and a farmer's market across the street in Bologna, part of Paris. We we're about one mile from the Roland Garros tennis courts. We didn't know anything about the tennis park, so we procrastinated until the night before to figure things out. We decided to walk because if we were going to watch a bunch of tennis, we knew we would be sitting for many hours and the exercise would do us good. The night before we were to venture to the stadium, rain washed away all impurities in the atmosphere, so the following morning was going to be bright. In order to get the admission tickets, an email forwarded by Josh requested that we download a Roland Garros app. I had to delete a couple of apps on my phone to download the Roland Garros app and noticed the app received a 3.7 star rating, which I presumed was because why would you need an app to show a unique admission barcode? After downloading the app, I noticed tons of extra information and felt it was too much information to just figure out where to go and when. The bottom of the app had a menu bar with ticket as an option, which ticket holder or each ticket holder has to log in without a password by entering their sex, birthday, using a calendar that increments by months starting in 2017, first name, last name, and email. Finally, you get a ticket with a 60 by 60 square barcode with the time 10 a.m., court name, seat number, range, or row, and escalator. A nifty link gives you the Google Maps information as well. Judith decided to wear a dress to the game because she thought we had to look fancy and I wore my usual UV protective long sleeve shirt and Vans Warped Tour hat. I had only gotten five hours of sleep in the past two days, so I was not in a particularly great mood and didn't feel like analyzing what to expect. We left the apartment at 9.30 a.m. to walk the estimated 22 minute walk. We walked one eighth mile to the Bologna Circle and realized we didn't know which road would take us there, so we trekked through a dog park by a sleeper, sleepy Parisian snoring on a bench and quietly closed 
the green metal gate behind us. We walked by increasingly more expensive looking Paris apartments and hotels until we reached the entrance to the Roland Garros Park. The park had young women and men asking us where we were going. We showed them the app with the ticket, but the first girl to speak to us would not let us in, where the majority of people were walking in. Everybody else had an orange badge indicating they were employees. They had to walk around, or we had to walk around, a hundred feet of barricades in either direction to enter the same entrance. There was a lot of people in suits and ties watching the entrance, and they asked for our tickets. I walked behind Judith and forgot to show them my app, and it didn't seem to matter. All the employees were excited and smiling. One of the employees asked where I was going, and I replied, To see Nadal. And they responded that, or, and they responded with a look that expressed, "Cool, go ahead." There were guard, there were guards with SMGs standing vigilant, and they responded with a smile after I waved and said, "Bonjour." So the atmosphere was still inviting. The dark green Roland Garros barricades corralled us into a security check, where we were patted down by same-sex glove-wearing employees. Past the security, we waited behind 50 people eagerly waiting for 10 a.m. so the gates to the park can open. Music reminiscent of Wii Tennis played as we or played and was interrupted by a female voice asking us to not buy tickets off the street because they may not work when scanned in both English and French. The loudspeakers were four feet by one feet squared, painted green, and blended into the forest landscape. Speakers seemed to be placed every 50 feet, giving us excellent sound quality. 10 a.m. strikes and Roland Garros opens up on the dot. Again, two young women on either side wearing fancy uniforms one by one check our IDs against our tickets as we walk through a 10 foot wide gate. We were in and didn't know where to go. Judith was cold because her dress wasn't very thick, and the sun was often obscured by a passing cloud. A cool 10 mile per hour breeze came every 30 seconds, chilling us further. I was fine, but Judith wanted to wear a sweater. Men wearing suits and girls wearing skirts guarded each entrance to the Philip Chatrier tennis court and politely told us the match didn't start until 12.45 p.m. We kept walking clockwise around the Philip Chatcher Stadium slash court. I told Judith it was the court that we had tickets for, and a man wearing a suit interrupted and excitedly said, It sure is! My mood was changing to anticipation because the employees were really happy despite being hours before the game. We made our way to the northern side of the court to find a row of merchants selling select items. Judith needed a sweater, so she got one, and the girl running the place was very nice, giving us time and space to find a sweater that fit. The store was the size of a semi-truck trailer with only three white walls, which reminded me of small shops in New York. I think the sweater was 75 euros, which initially seemed expensive, but the quality was well-made, athletic wear with a short, fine fleece on the inside, making it surprisingly useful. After exiting the store, Judith wanted to find some food, so we found crepes. Both under the stadium. Booth <laughs> under the stadium. Other employees were getting free crepes, but when we tried to pay for the, them, the cash register would not connect to the network, so an IT professional had to come and restart the computer. The crepes were just 12 inch, were just 12 inch diameter, 1 8 inch thick pancakes with granulated sugar on one side folded into a quarter pie with whipped cream or Nutella on top. I think it was three euros, but it was hot and surprisingly amazing. We decided to find our entrance escalator to the Philip uh, Chatcher Tennis Stadium, which took us two clockwise passes until we found it on the north side. We decided to explore the park to see what was beyond the Philip Chatcher Stadium. The only other stadium was the Salon Suzanne Langlen Stadium. Which, was a statu- which had a statue of her from the 1920s. I don't know who she is, but her statue looks great. I don't know who Philip Chatcher is either. 
We bumped into a quartet employed by Roland Garros demonstrated by the orange badges around their necks. They played a saxophone, clarinet, accordion, and double bass. They obviously played a lot together, as evidenced by their balanced volume. We didn't have to tip them because they were employees and they happily played French dance songs. We made our way to a little village that seemed to have nothing other than chairs, tables, parasols, and two French women smoking cigarettes. There was a tennis ball fountain, but it may as well have been any other ball. Just beyond the fountain was a wall with all the people who played in the tournament, with the semifinalists under, under, underlined. We took pictures pointing to the people we predicted to win. Of course, Dominic Thiem will beat Nadal. Not knowing what to do next, we decided to ask the information booth what our tickets meant. The girl running the booth told us that we, that we are there to watch Andy Murray and play against, or Andy Murray play against Stan Warinka, and we had to leave the stadium immediately after the match because many more people are going to enter the Nadal match. She said besides the Nadal match, all other matches were free. We were slightly disappointed that we wouldn't see Nadal, but whatever. To ease my disappointment, I knew smacking a tennis ball at a speedometer would be the, a great way to blow off some steam. Judith went first into the tent, so I pressured her by saying tons of people are waiting for her to finish, so she better hurry up. She looked so funny, wearing a dress and sandals, smacking a ball in the wrong corners of the tent. Some of her shots wouldn't register because the angle had to be aimed at the gun, and I didn't realize how small the tent was. I could not stop laughing. When my turn came up, I took even more shots and time than Judith because I managed to wedge the ball between the pole of the chain link and another shot had the ball roll out the tent through a small gap on the right side. The guy running the speedometer ran out to get his one ball, so I started practicing my serve by going through uh, the motions of a serve and as he ran back in the tent, I almost hit him with the racket. We were so embarrassed that we forgot to get our change and we had to run back into the tent before anyone else could try. Another person before us would try so hard they would slip and fall, and another would toss the ball too high, bouncing it off the ceiling. Ah, it was f too funny. In the meantime, I was remarking about the large tennis balls, saying that someone should make a large racket to match when, when all of a sudden we spotted a boy with a huge tennis racket. He was working for Babylon trying to get people to sign up for their new app that tracked how much tennis you play with a chip that is inserted into the handle of, the, of your tennis racket. It also measures the speed of your serve. We lied to him told him we would sign up if he would let us pose with his giant racket. Judith remembered that Josh wanted some clay from the clay court, but we were sure security wouldn't let us run down and grab some, but I recalled that there were six clay tennis courts that had normal bleacher seating between the Salon and Phillip stadiums. We might get some clay from those courts, since it was probably the same kind from the stadium. Unfortunately, the six clay courts had people playing matches and were unable to get in between breaks. In the Salon court, McEnroe, uh, Michael Chan, and two other people were playing doubles. A line of people were waiting to get in the stadium to see the free match, so Judith and I watched from a bench a jumbotron screen of what is going on. We saw McEnroe miss a volley and throw his racket into the net because he only needed one point to secure his service game. I told Judith he was going to ace Michael Chan, and sure enough, Michael was too far to the right, and McEnroe aced him down the middle, securing the game. It is refreshing to see McEnroe still playing competitively, and I remember Michael Chan was David Hong's favorite player in high school. To have them play for free to those who entered the park is very nice, but Judith was hungry and it was already 12 p.m., so I went to go or went to the Roland Garros restaurant. The restaurant was confusing because we entered the Ramada style structure through a maze of ribbons for long lines of people, but there was, there was no line. Before entering the area where you get food, a poster had a list of 11 items like quiche and things that I wasn't familiar with. 
I went with the pioneering attitude of just surveying everything quickly and finding the sexiest thing. Judith fell for the salad trap, which had a poached egg on top, which she mistook for a monster, for mozzarella cheese. I scored by grabbing a wooden tray and spotted a skinny boy wearing a chef's hat with red hair and freckles covering up a platter of freshly fried battered fish. I wasn't terribly hungry, but maybe because we were so late eating, he had to get rid of the fish, so he gave me a heaping portion. I reflect reflexively whispered, Wow, thank you. When our eyes met, he started laughing at me, and I thought he looked ridiculous. I started laughing, but luckily a girl wearing a white apron explained that I get the quiche and some potatoes while she poured them onto my plate. Judith grabbed a raspberry tart along with her salad, and we tested the food under a parasol, shading a table and two chairs. The fish was crispy with tasty tartar sauce, and the quiche was a stack of eggplant, tomato slice, cucumber slice, and pesto sauce, which was all sautéed in olive oil. If that red-haired kid made his made this food, he is freaking amazing. Judith's tart made up for her lackluster salad. 12.45 was coming up fast, so we walked to our entrance and found our seat, which took a couple tries because the even-numbered seats were on the right, while the odd were on the left, and there is no room for people to walk past a person already sitting in a seat in their row. This is a little, there is a little room, but not a whole lot. The stadium was loud until the match started, and everyone whispered or was dead silent. I got nervous because I didn't think I can pay attention for the whole game, while I also didn't want to cheer for the wrong guy. Thank God people in the audience weren't terribly serious. We all cheered whenever there was a long rally, and either pe- and either person got the, or yeah, sorry. We all cheered whenever there was a long rally, and either person got the point. We didn't cheer when people hit the ball into the net on a return. Stan Warinka was more, has more articulation in his form, allowing for greater smackage on overheads. But Andy seems to have more experience, allowing him to anticipate Warinka's aggressive strategy, which allowed Andy to win the first set 7-6 with a tiebreaker 8-6. During the tiebreaker, Andy would get ahead by two points where he, an- where he anticipated Warinka's aggressive position and the whole stadium cheered because Andy clearly read Warinka like a, ch- a child's book. When Warinka came back to even out uh, the points in the tiebreaker, We cheered, and then he double-pumped his fist as if to remind us that he was losing all this time, and he never gives up, and we all cheered even harder. Every three games, the players would take a two-minute break, marked by the sound of the speakers playing a Pepsi can opening. The audience would stand up and stretch. The noise subsides quickly because the players are eager to get this game over. Four or five times during the match, not not a two-minute break. A member of the audience would impersonate a trumpet and sing, ba ba da ba 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 da ba and the crowd would scream, Ole! I thought it was, it was not so nice, or, so, or I thought it was not nice, so I'd try and sabotage the effort by screaming, Ole! A half beat too early or too late. I didn't get the feeling that people thought it was being mean, they just thought it was a goof. After the third set, Andy won two out of three, and Judith and I thought the match was over. We started to exit the stadium as per instruction, but by the time we reached the exit, the fourth set began, and a girl in uniform told me I had to go back to my seat. I told her I was sorry, and I thought the match was over. Judith and I managed to get back to our seats in the next two-minute break, but other people were getting restless as well. The northern, northeastern side of the stadium screamed, uh, and crescendoed and stood up and raised their hands, starting a wave. We all watched, we all watched three hours of tennis and decided to keep the wave going for two revolutions around the stadium. Andy and Stan just stood back and watched us. It was really inconsiderate and funny. And finally, Andy finally lost the best three out of five sets after five hours. I think 
we were all delirious after that much tennis. We cheered for Stan and Andy and walked back to the apartment to tend our sunburns. Looking back, I can't help but feel that the French Open is a special event carried out by passionate kids and adults. The kids and adults don't necessarily play tennis, but they sympathize with the emotion and cheer the success of playing the best you can.